Welcome everyone to a webinar today hosted by the annual conference on Native American nutrition. As many of you know, because of the pandemic, we've had to postpone our conference, which should have taken place this last September. We will be hosting a fifth conference. It is uh, going to be either fall of 2021 or spring of 2022, whenever we, we, we are certain that it's gonna be safe to hold, but we will be having another conference. In the meantime, this year we're hosting a series of webinars and we are delighted today to have a panel of wonderful, wonderful experts on food as health. Uh, and we're, they're gonna be talking about uh, indigenous viewpoints on this, their own personal experiences. And I would like to begin by introducing the, pat, the, the moderator of this panel, who is Valerie Segrest. Val is an enrolled member of the Muckleshoot Indian tribe. She serves as the Native American Agricultural Fund's Regional Director for Native Food and Knowledge Systems, in addition to that. She has a Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition and Health Sciences from Bastyr University and a Master of Arts in Environment and Community. Val has dedicated her work in the field of Native American nutrition towards the efforts of food sovereignty rooted in education, awareness, and overcoming barriers to accessing traditional foods for tribal communities throughout North America. She has co-authored several publications, including the books Feeding the People, Feeding the Spirit, Revitalizing Northwest Coastal Indian Food Culture, and Feeding Seven Generations, a Salish cookbook. Valerie aims to inspire and enlighten others about the importance of a nutrient dense diet through a culturally appropriate common sense approach to eating. She has been a speaker at our conference and every time she speaks, people wanna hear more. So I now turn it over to you. Thank you to our moderator, Val Segrist. Thank you, Mindy. Um, it's so good to be here, uh, even if it's virtually with all of you. Uh, I'm really excited for today. Today we get to hear from several champions and catalysts who serve tribal communities using our foods as medicines, as a modality to heal on all levels, physically, mentally, spiritually, and communally. And how is our food our medicine? I've been really thinking about this the last several days. And I suppose part of it is just the everyday caring and the considerate effort that goes into it all. What a gift in the midst of so many turmoils in our modern lives, the imbalance of dysfunctional relationships, political divides, global pandemics, all has such a less scintillating appearance. And you may begin to wonder, how can I help? What can I do to contribute and be a part of the type of world I so badly want to see and live in? To find a simple and powerful way like returning to your ancestral foods, to express warmth, kindness, to bring people together and to transform. By working to renew our spirits, we are also working to essentially renew the world and renew our relatives, our friends, our neighbors reconnecting with the earth, reconnecting with our common heritage, our share, shared life and livelihood by simply eating like the ancestors. So today I get the great honor of introducing uh, some of these catalysts and uh, some, of, some people I consider close comrades and admire greatly. Um, I'm gonna start with Twyla Hazador, San Carlos Apache. Uh, Twyla has been working with San Carlos Apache, White Mountain Apache, and Yavapai people for the past 25 years, conducting interviews with elders to bring information back into the community to address health and social problems. With the Western Apache Diet Project, Twyla has documented the importance of foods like grass seeds and acorn seeds to the diets of Apaches before people were moved onto reservations and became reliant on rations and later commodities. Twyla, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about your work and name a traditional food that you feel really drawn to and why. Okay. Um, 
My name is Twyla again, and I work with the Western Apache Tribe. What I work with is uh, reintroducing traditional food ways and traditional practices back, with the, back within the communities that we've been working with. Also working mostly with people that are really, um, oh, okay. <laughs> I just so funny, I just froze, I'm so sorry. Okay, so working with people addressing the health crisis in our communities. And then it's various levels of health crisis, you deal with trauma, you deal with historical trauma, you're dealing with depression, so there's all sorts of, sorts of um, crises that are within a community, also addiction. But using traditional harvesting and foraging and traditional methods and helping address those crises and also helping people to heal using those methods. And for traditional food, I honestly say emery oak acorn is my favorite food. We call it chichil. And it's been with our community since time and memorial. It is really linked with in our DNA and our genetics. I always say because when you look for emery oak acorn and you look out through the whole world, you will not find it nowhere. It's just an original Apache Rio boundary. And you re do research on that, you will see that it grows within a certain region where Apaches have always lived. It's also a staple, very highly prized within our community that's used in ceremonies, uh, holidays, celebrations, and also um, how you can say in, um, in some of the sacred ceremonies. So emery oak acorn is the best thing ever. I mean, I just love acorn. So using that ingredient and also addressing, um, how is it, using that food source and helping people to reconnect to who they are as Apache people has been very amazing tool to use acorn. And when they see it, I mentioned that, yes, we are, we, we have always eaten this the way we've always eaten it. And it seems to be carried on, carried on. And also emery oak acorn is a long, one of the longest living oak trees. And I tell people we're just as strong, as resilient as those emery oak that took care of us from our beginning then to today. We've always used it in our ceremonies and it has a reputation, representation of longevity, strength, resiliency, and fertility when we're using in ceremony. So it represents a lot. And also using traditional, how do you say, the language. Language is a big thing. It helps carry the food. It also helps carry the stories and help carry who we are as people. So today we say water. People say water, oh, you know, I like a cup of water. And we say tu shanka you actually talking to the water. So our, our language talks with the elements. Also, when you go down to the streams and rivers and you listen to the water, it goes The water taught us how to say water. We don't say water, we say two. The same language the water speaks. Same thing with some of the plant, clochi. You get the beautiful little plant and there's a dark red seed on, on it. The plant taught us how to say tochi. So it's beautiful when people engage in that and start to recognize their food and also starting to learn their language. It's just, it's just amazing. I love what I do and I love working within the community and also sharing the knowledge. So thank you. Thank you, Twyla. I love that acorns are like, every time I eat, you know, an acorn or even in the Northwest, it's hazelnut. I think about how I'm eating a whole entire tree. <laughs> and it's just that like sustained integrity and, you know, dense energy that's in there. Um, so much life-giving um, medicine in that, in that one tiny bite. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I daydream about just foraging with you in the Apache territory someday. Oh, that. absolutely. Um, all right, we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce Nephi Craig next. I'm just going down the list here. Chef Nephi 
Craig has 22 years of culinary experience in America and around the world in London, Germany, Brazil, and Japan. Nephi is an enrolled member of the White Mountain Apache tribe and is half Navajo. Chef Craig is also the founder of the Native American Culinary Association or NACA, an organization network that is dedicated to the research, refinement, and development of Native American cuisine. Chef Nephi provides training workshops and lecture sessions on Native American cuisine for health to schools, restaurants, universities, treatment centers, behavioral health agencies, and tribal entities from across America and abroad. Uh, chef Craig recently served as executive chef of the Sunrise Park Resort Hotel, where I was able to eat some of his amazing uh, squash and beans. Oh my gosh. Um, and during Chef Craig's nine year tenure at Sunrise Park Resort, Craig and his White Mountain Apache culinary team achieved many national and international benchmarks in establishing a culture of indigenous foods across North America. Executive Chef Nephi Craig is currently the Nutritional Recovery Program Coordinator and Executive Chef at the Rainbow Treatment Center and Cafe Guzzo on the White Mountain Apache Tribe in Arizona. Please correct me if I totally slaughter that. Uh, I, it's my honor to introduce Nephi today and, um, and just the work he carries uh, around transforming people by cooking. <laughs> cooking is a transformative process and how inspiring uh, his work really is. So Nephi, do you mind telling us, I know that these bios are really, you know, um, sort of secular, but how, can you give us some information about the work you're doing and a food, a traditional food that you feel, feel really drawn to and why? Yes, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for taking the time to uh, come and support the, this, this webinar, this Native Nutrition Conference. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you all being here with us to hear, uh, hear what we have to say and share. Um, as you know, Native American nutrition is a very important topic that will carry us into the next, you know, next few generations. Um, so uh, um, I work in substance abuse treatment, and uh, I also have been cooking professionally for 20 years as a, as a classically trained chef. And um, I just like to say always, every time I share about the work that I do is that um, uh, indigenous foods and food ways have really um, revitalized and changed my life in a way that I just could have never, ever anticipated when I first started cooking. Um, I think uh, it's really guided and provided a lot of uh, really powerful experiences uh, around just life in general, uh, being a parent, being a community member, and just being a, uh, just being, just being a professional, I guess. And it's really through the food ways and the behaviors that are attached that have brought the most powerful lessons. And um, so I, I'm very fortunate to be able to combine the, the clinical nature of substance abuse work and treatment and prevention, and also the, uh, the innovative side and creative side of culinary arts. Um, I've been doing, um, since I first went to culinary school, I felt left out of world cuisine or we felt left out of world cuisine. So I ultimately wanted to do something with native foods. Um, I wanted to be able to articulate our best qualities and values through native foods uh, as a chef. And uh, early on, it was very clear that there was no representation of who we were, or at least I could find in 1998 before the, the hyper-connectivity of social media and the food phenomenon we see on TV. I felt really alone and uh, isolated. So I wanted to give myself to the, to the um, to the art of cooking. And I just figured I'd start something that we needed. And um, so along the way, this, this is a, a really neat example of one of the traditional foods that have really taught me a lot. Um, it's a combination of ingredients. Um, it's, uh, I have a big jar of it right here. Can you see that? Um, this, is a, this is actually a dish or a, a combination of seeds that I learned from Twyla in her work with the Western Apache um, Food Project. And this mixture of seeds, um, there's not just one particular variety. Uh, this mixture right here in particular has uh, pine nuts, sunflower seeds, uh, parched white corn from in Debikia in, in, in Kenyan Day, Arizona, our community farm. Has a little bit of a popped amaranth in there, has a little bit of squash seeds and sunflower seeds, and a little bit of acorns too. Um, this, this particular seed mix, um, I think I've, I, 
Twyla in her work introduced me to it, um, I think about 2011 or 12, I think. And since then, this to me is one of my favorite ingredients. As a chef, I use it creatively to do both sweet and savory applications. Uh, but I think it's best uh, consumed just like this, um, just in its natural form. Um, but the reason I say that it is such uh, a powerful food, and maybe this will, um, for the viewers, will help you to kind of follow your own journey, is that by, by trying to understand each of these little seeds in here, each one has its own voice and its own history, its own relationship with our people, its own seasonality, its own planting. It's a combination of wild and cultivated foods. And uh, so to me, this is really more valuable than like foie gras or caviar or, you know, real fine, fine dining Western ingredients that are fancy, because this tells me as a person more about my identity than anything that classical cuisine could have ever taught me. Um, so this is one of my favorite ingredients uh, or foods. It's a mixture of seeds. So um, I, it's, it's really cool to me. I'm really grateful to have come across it. So it's taught me the most. So yeah, that's, that's my favorite. It's so great. It's like this life staining, sustaining life, like emergence force, you know, all in that, like think about all the life that's in that jar you're just holding up there. It's like a blanket of food that could feed so many people because it just keeps producing and proliferating. And that's, that's what this is really all about, you know, feeding people, um, not just in our everyday bodies. <laughs> it's like when, uh, I have had the ability to watch you work in the kitchen um, in the Apaches in the Kitchen project. And first of all, it was really exciting to walk into a kitchen and hear like social distortion playing and see be you know, beans boiling on the stove and just so many people having fun. But like the, the other body that you get into, uh, that the body of your children, the body of your parents, of your ancestors, that interconnected body that demands you know, smelling, touch, touching, tasting, being a part of all of it and all the emergence and transformation that comes out. And then you get to just offer that up to people and you can feel all that in there in that food that you put on the table. It's so, it's so delicious. Um, I really appreciate the work you carry, Nephi. Um, I'm going to move on to you, Dr. Warren next, who has been, um, for me, just someone I've known from afar and just getting to know and starting to have a conversation with and planning for this discussion. And, and like I have been talking about our discussion last week, I've been talking about it all week, is this library, this compendium of you know, research that I've always wanted to scratch and look at. And so um, I'm really excited to hear more from, from Dr. Warren today, who's a member of the Ogallala Lakota tribe in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. As a director of Indians into Medicine, director of Pub Master Public Health Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. He earned his Doctorate of Medicine degree from the Stanford University School of Med and completed his residency training at the Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona. He's earned his master's of public health degree from Harvard and Dr. Warren served several years as a primary care and integrative medicine physician with the Gila River Healthcare Corporation in Sacaton, Arizona, and three years as staff clinician with the National Institute of Health in Phoenix. During Dr. Warren's time in Arizona, he conducted diabetes research and developed diabetes education and prevention programs in partnership with tribes. Previously, he served as chair of the Department of Public Health at North Dakota, North Dakota State University. He currently serves as, as adjunct professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and Stanford University of South Dakota Medical School. An adjunct clinical professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, Indian Legal Program at Arizona State University. Dr. Warren is a member of the National Board of Trustees for March of Dimes, the Health Disparities Subcommittee for the Center for Disease Control, and the National Advisory Committee for Rural Health and Human Services with the Department of Health and Human Services. And I don't know how he has time to do anything else. That's one busy man. Uh, Dr. Warren, can you tell us more about your work um, and a traditional food that you feel really drawn to and why? Hello, thank you and welcome to all my relations here today. I'm very honored to be a part of these discussions and 
I really appreciated Twyla's comment that uh, the, the water taught us how to say water, that we speak the language of the water and Nephi and Valerie talking about uh, an acorn and how you're eating the, the seed of a, a, an entire tree. You know, it's just really amazing the life force that, that our food gives us. So in my current roles, I'm uh, working as a, an educator as well as administrator and researcher. And the things that we're looking at are trying to increase the numbers of American Indian people going into health sciences. And we have a brand new PhD program in indigenous health. And much of what we talk about is food sovereignty and the changes in access to healthy food and how that's had an impact uh, on the health of our people over the years. So uh, for us as Lakota and, and many of the Northern Plains tribes, of course, buffalo was one of the, the primary food sources. And uh, as an educator, of course, I'll, I have some uh, PowerPoint slides <laughs> that I want to show only just for, uh, for a couple of minutes. But for the, the buffalo or the bison, it's called the Pte Oyate. And that's actually the, the Buffalo Nation or Buffalo people. Oyate means people. And we look at our fellow creatures, uh, two-leggeds and four-leggeds, as being part of the same life force and life energy. And certainly, we, we have food from the buffalo, but we also have cultural lessons and life lessons by observing the natural world around us, including from the buffalo. So buffalo, of course, provided a food source. You know, the meat is uh, uh, very lean. Uh, very uh, uh, high protein content, much healthier than typical uh, beef that we would have now. But the buffalo is much more than just a source of food. Of course, the, the hide was used for, uh, for clothing, for shelter, for teepees. Um, we use the, uh, the organs for different purposes. Uh, and of course, the bones were used for tools and even for um, uh, 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 weaponry and that type of thing. So there's more to it than just the food access. We had this close relationship with buffalo over the years. But in terms of one of the healthier foods, when you combine dried buffalo with choke cherries and uh, grind them together, it's a traditional food, food called wasna. And wasna is incredibly tasty, uh, kind of renamed as pemmican in, in, in some uh, forms. But this combination of food is incredibly nutritious, and this is what our people uh, lived on. We could have stored uh, wasna throughout the winters and, and having that healthy food. And we still eat this in, in my home. Every year I go buffalo hunting, and uh, my children have uh, buffalo and berries several times a week. And I think uh, as a result, are very healthy physically. I think one thing that we lose track of is that when we would uh, kill a buffalo for food, there was a ceremony attached to it, and the spiritual implications of taking a life were recognized. You know, in modern times, you go to the store to, to buy meat, and it's in these neatly packaged containers with clear plastic, and we don't actually think about the fact that this represents a spirit that was taken, a life that was taken to feed us. So in many ways, in modern times, we've taken the spirit out of the food. And that's why we really consider food as medicine because we're absorbing it, whether it's a seed of an entire tree or taking the life of a fellow creature to feed our families. There's ceremony and recognition of the spiritual nature behind that. Unfortunately, as we know, we nearly lost all the buffalo um, in the, by the 1800s, what had been estimated over 30 million buffalo were down to less than a thousand. And the other challenge here, when I look at this terrible image is all of those skulls are also sacred objects or for religious purposes, we consider the buffalo skull an altar. So we've uh, absorbed a lot of loss as a result of that. And uh, just one last comment regarding the, the buffalo, we also learn a lot of lessons from them. And when we observe them during the, the times of storms, we see the strongest bulls face the storm and protect those that are behind them. And I use this as a metaphor for those of us who are educated and for those of us who work in these sectors is that it's really a responsibility to face the storm, to have that resilience and ab absorb the challenges because there are people behind us who need, uh, need help, need assistance, need to improve uh, their, their circumstances. And for those of us who are fortunate enough to be in these positions of higher education and in the health professions, we need to recognize that there's a life lesson embedded within the story of the buffalo and that we need to face the storm head on and protect the health of future generations. So that's a very brief overview, but there's a lot to that story of the buffalo 
and the Oyate and, and my people, the Lakota. Thank you for sharing that. I am always reminded of, uh, we do a lot of deer hunting and elk hunting out here and, um, and actually just finished up a, a ram hunt. And uh, I'm always thinking about how the, those animals are just the ultimate embodiment of the landscape of all the plants that are there. You know, that beautiful salad bar that they get to eat essentially <laughs> on the prairie lands. And then we get to eat that and how sharing that animal with your family is part of what bind and holds us together as a people, um, as in communally, you know, it's such uh, medicine on so many different levels. Um, so joining us by phone, we have Faith Spotted Eagle. Uh, she is a grandmother who lives in the Dakota Territory in southeastern South Dakota. She has a master's degree in counseling and has been a school principal, manager of human services programs, and a PTSD therapist for the Veterans Administration. She is a fluent speaker of the Dakota language and a member of the Ihantanwan. Uh, I'm sorry if I screwed that up. Although she descends from the Sinkangu, Humpati, Hungpapa, and Metatawanwan. Faith, save me here. <laughs> um, she is a founding grandmother of the Braveheart Society, supervised by a group of community grandmothers called the Unki Circle, which is dedicated to environmental justice and restoring endangered and lost cultural practices to heal the wounds endured by the Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota peoples. Faith has been involved in grassroots work for decades and the Braveheart Society has been instrumental in many areas, including battling for environmental justice within native communities, healing survivors of sexual violence and utilizing traditional spiritual ceremonies of the Otsete Sakawan to fight historical trauma. Faith, correct all of my mistakes here. I'm really sorry. Um, okay. Do you mind sharing with us after you correct all my mistakes? <laughs> um, what uh, uh, something uh, the more about the work that you carry and a traditional food that you feel really drawn to and why? Okay. Well, good morning. I'm bet to watch the you pick it and I bet you a fee. I shake your, give you a virtual handshake uh, from Ihangtua territory on this beautiful morning. Um, I'm as you said. She said, I'm an elder, I'm 72 years young, um, and I'm a grandmother of the Braveheart Society, but I think I was born into this, and it's always been a natural part of my life, because I was raised by a World War II um, warrior who went to the South Pacific, and then beyond that, um, my grandmother was at the White Stone Massacre, my great-grandma, and she was, a, they don't, they didn't call them healers. They call them Waapia, well, the people who make things, take care of things. And so her life way was like the prairie was her medicine cabinet. And so I grew up with that um, knowledge and that mentoring. It, we didn't call it mentoring. It was just a way of life for my grandmother. And all of my grandmothers lived to be a ripe old age. My, um, the Waapia, well, she died in her, I think, 95. My grandmother who raised me died, uh, lived to be 104. My aunt, my dad's sister lived to be 104 about three years ago so that's probably like about 600 900 years of oral history and so that became a natural part of my life because we were pretty self-sufficient and I grew up like a wild little Indian and when people would come to our our place we'd say run my grandma would say Yanka, washi chunaki, upi, the white people are coming and we'd run for the plum bushes and we'd be peering out of there like little wild Indians which is a, a good word for me and um, or indigenous anyway. And so we had uh, aquaculture. We dammed, my dad dammed up the creek. We could go out and jump in the stream and retrieve the fish. Uh, we had every conceivable animal. So we were pretty self-sufficient. We were ready for any pandemic because we lived through many pandemics through our oral history. So having had that, uh, I heard the individual earlier talking about the spirit that lives in all of the beings on earth and one of the battles that we've been involved in for the last 13 years is trying to protect the water and fighting the KXL pipeline. I've been doing that for 13 years and the endangered species 
And so when you think about those species that we're trying to protect, like the burying beetle, did you know that the burying beetle navigates by star knowledge? And so when it's on a cloudy day, they get a little bit confused because they navigate by the stars. And in our oral history, we all have um, star stories of why we came from, how we came from the stars and how that's important. So again, we have a common DNA tie with uh, another uh, relative on earth beyond the buffalo. And so, and then you look at the cranes, the cranes that are being endangered by all this oil development, the fossil fuel development, the crane is seen as a symbol of bravery, ohitika, uh, means to be brave because the crane with their sharp beaks could actually pierce your brain or your body with one huge peck if, if it came down to it. So they were seen as uh, symbols of bravery. So every single one of these, and you know, uh, the, the bat, the bat, there's an old oral history where the animals all came together at the beginning when they could all talk and they still talk. We just can't hear them and we can't understand them. And that's our, our responsibility. But when they came together, the animals couldn't figure out how they would let the bat in because they, they had wings, but they were like an animal. And so they were going to leave out the bat, but they came to consensus that the bat had a role. And indeed, if you study it, there are species that are in our beadwork, like the maggot, wakaduna. My grandma used to say that they would say, we have to run, we have to preserve, the wakadunas are coming. And she meant the Euro-American people, they're like maggots. But that's kind of an insult to maggots because maggots have a role where they clean up leftover food on the bones, on the flies. You know, they take care of those things. So every single niche of that ecosystem is related to how we take care of our food. Because some of them are food, but they... So that's why we make that exchange when we teach my little seven-year-old elk hunter, Takoja boy, that he has to pray for the exchange when they took the elk a few weeks ago. So um, as far as other food sovereignty, I am the just, oh, I'm so humbled by receiving corn, uh, padani corn. We call it Pawnee corn that actually came from the Mandan. And my grandma had actual memory of the exchange that was made for the Junta ceremony that came from the Mandan people. And she always claimed that like it was an everyday event just happening yesterday that the Mandan cousins were very close to her when they made that gift 600 years ago to the rest of the people. The Ihangtua received it about 300 years ago. And so I have the seed from that corn. And I remember my grandmother a bit harshly and my dad said, don't you lose that. You're absent-minded because they worried about me being absent-minded and they'd be horrified how absent-minded I am now, but I'm sure they helped me out. But I have that 600-year-old corn. So this past uh, spring with the pandemic, we tilled 107 gardens on our territory, 107 gardens, gardeners. A lot of them were new young people. And of course, they were scared about killing their plants. And I said, well, even if you kill them, the plants will forgive you and you could try again, you could do it better. And so we're in the middle of what we call a resurgence because we've always had food sovereignty, just like we've always had murdered and missing indigenous women. All of that began with contact. A lot of this, we um, don't give ourselves credit for that. We knew all of this and we were the original scientists. I wanna give a shout out to the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, which I'm honored to be a Council of Elders uh, person. And I am so amazed and just literally humbled by the thousands of young native people that are coming out of STEM. And I'm sure Dr. Warren is familiar with that, maybe some of you, but I'll stop there and take a breath because I'm sure you have a question for me. I could talk all day long, so guide me. <laughs> I'm still thinking about the beetle that <laughs> is guided by the stars. Like, how cute! Isn't that the that's the cutest thing I've ever heard? To be honest, like it's they're not out cute. Around. It's not cute. It's powerful. It is literally yeah, powerful it, because we follow in their footsteps because our sacred sites are cosmology of the star universe, and so a lot of the sacred sites that we have all across the northern plains are replicas of the um, constellations. And so we're a lot closer tied to the stars than we realize. And indeed, that's where the oral history says that we come from. I love it. So we're probably the early alien nation. They still treat us like aliens, so Ancient it's okay. Aliens. Um, well, 
that brings us to our second question. And um, I think I'll just keep going in the order we were introduced in. Uh, so Twyla, the second question for all panelists is, uh, as a practitioner who serves your community utilizing culture and traditional foods as a method of healing, what are you witnessing? Uh, how do traditional foods help people recover from trauma and also encourage resilience? Twyla, do you, does a story come to mind? You're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So using, using traditional, what we're doing in this project and just seeing what's happening is like, especially during this pandemic, prior before, like previously in previous years was giving up traditional seats to throughout all the communities. And within this one community that I'm in, which is in San Carlos, we gave up, we had a little over 40, gardens last year and with this pandemic this past year we had over 160 to 180 gardens come up using traditional seeds that a lot of people were really interested in mostly because they're drought resistant they're sustainable you don't need a lot of care in it but it really produces a lot so for people it was reconnecting back to those traditional food ways, not only for food security, but also engage the family and engage in the stories about a lot of these foods and where they came from and the origin stories for some of these foods that were planted. So for myself, using the method that we're doing and seeing what's happening is seeing people reconnect to themselves mostly, how to heal within themselves and using what always been with us since our beginning is using those traditional healing methods to help people heal. And for, I'll just take one story is seeing a young boy, we went out foraging out in a Sepp area, which is surrounded by rocks area. And it's where a massacre had occurred. And during that massacre, um, a lot of people were killed. A lot of our people, my relatives were killed there. But for this young boy to go out foraging during one of our seasons, he was able to help forage. He learned about the stories. He stood there and looked at the landscape. And for one of the elders to tell this individual a story about this one person's survival and how this one individual had survived as an infant and how his grandmother had taken this child as far as she could is this young boy stood there listening so deep and the, the elders telling him and I'm talking to him and we're telling him about what happened. And to, for, him, for him to find out that he, uh, that was his great, great grandmother, that child that survived that massacre. And for this person, it was a person that was dealing with, um, how you say, getting involved with drugs, getting involved with gangs, and he was in a, you know, in a situation that he didn't expect to really be into, but for him to go there and see where he actually was from and to hear the story of what had happened to his family and how he is a survivor of such an amazing woman, something transformed in that child that day. And today he has finished nearly three years of college. He has a job, relearning his language. He reconnected with himself. We have so many stories like this that working with this project was watching people connect and heal, whether it be from sexual violence. I share that story in the film called Gather. Um, also to help people heal with the um, suicide, how to cope without medication, how to not be dependent on uh, a clinical science. When we have our own science, we can't say science, but we have our way of healing and dealing with and addressing a lot of these crises that we're facing today. But seeing people reconnect, people heal, and to really people, how you say, connect within themselves and knowing that they're not alone. And Mother Earth has always been with them from the beginning of our time. And she's always loved us and always will. And just getting people to look at food differently and understanding food in a respectful way 
where you're not going to, I explain to people when we're out foraging, you're not going to grocery store and you're not taking everything you see by your eyes because you look so good to you. You're going to grandma's house. You're asking her. That's why you pray before you gather. This is why you have a moment of respect for the plant that you're going to gather. You don't just take. When they learn that process, they don't look at food the same. They have a sense of respect for it. And also when you're at grandma's house, you don't take everything from grandma. You just ask her politely. And it may take some time. You see grandma, you know, producing all these beautiful fruits out there. And, and you you like, I want some now, but you got to wait because it's still fruiting. It's growing you know, with patience. So they learn patience when they're out there. So it's a really beautiful process that we're working with. I love where it's going. I like to see it expand more. And mostly I just, per, I personally see the results, which is amazing. And it's using the indigenous approach to healing and using traditional food as an approach to healing and using that within our, our programs and other programs to help people cope with what we're dealing with today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Twyla. You're so right. It's. Um... We talk about the that change and that removal from our food systems, and I think it's it diminishes the actual trauma that you know is stored in our memory. And so when you reconnect with those things, it's like this light comes on inside of people, and they get a better sense of who they are and where they come from. It's such powerful medicine, and it's just as simple exactly. as putting a plant in someone's hand or taking them out, you know, into a space where there's that memory of the land and how the land knows you and is able to just provide so many more answers that um, we can't find in textbooks really, you know? Uh, I think that's all kind of catching up to what we mean when we say food, our food is our medicine. Um, I wonder, Nephi, do you wanna share anything about um, what you see as a practitioner using culture and traditional foods as a method of healing? Yeah, I, uh, I'm really grateful for the question because I think it really provides a lot of uh, framework for, for us to operate under and to utilize because uh, I, I, I am witnessing um, uh, a lot of very powerful moments that are either very, very small and intimate or very big as well. Uh, working in substance abuse treatment and combining indigenous food ways. Um, I think what I'm witnessing personally as a practitioner is that uh, indigenous food ways are validating Western science, not Western science validating indigenous food ways. Uh, I think yeah. it's really neat to see the catch up. Like if you even think of um, how the science of a sweat lodge works, and they're just articulating what we already know. Uh, from detoxifying the body and then add to that nutritious foods and mindfulness practices, right? These are all combined in our, in our food ways, in our life ways. And so <clears throat> I've, I've been able to really witness uh, some of those, those very powerful intimate moments. And uh, like, like Twyla mentioned in her response to that question too, is it, the foods really do, um, for me personally, I feel like they really teach um, they really teach and encapsulate, encapsulate emotional intelligence. I feel like they really give us an appreciation. Like she said, they teach us patience and diligence and hard work and even planning. Um, be, uh, like I'll reference that seed mix again. This is a, this is a wintertime food. The squash and corn and uh, sunflower seeds have been growing all summer long just to be calorie rich and appropriate for right now in the wintertime. Um, so the, the planning process that goes into it, um, I've seen um, um, people uh, add indigenous food ways or use cooking and foraging or gardening as a layer of their support system in recovery, whether it's from uh, incarceration, diabetes, uh, obesity, heart disease, or even substance abuse and addiction. And I feel like it's since it's so behavioral and so intimate, um, that's why I feel like indigenous foodways are so um, important and indigenous food sovereignty is really important. I used to, as a, as a person in recovery myself and as a chef and then kind of moving into a clinical environment and therapeutic environment, um, I used to think I was uh, close to the problem, right? 
um, addiction, um, heart disease, health disparities and all of that. But what the foods taught me is that, um, yeah, that might be true in kind of a Western context, but what the foods kind of taught me is that I'm close to the solution too. So it's like, wow, you know, like it's been there all along. Uh, where where it's and it's like um it's like um faith said or it's like a doctor um dr warren said we it's our responsibility to face the storm and that just like blew my mind that's what the food is teaching me now too so um there's many things that um i've witnessed that i'm very grateful for and i think it comes down to um having a real sense of humility and um having your heart open to these messages because if we're if we're kind of stuck in a stressed out frame of mind or we're kind of stuck in a in this certain mindset that's not really in tune with indigenous values, we're not gonna hear or see those messages that come through these little tiny voices in the foods. So um, that, that's kind of how I witness a lot of stuff. And um, also just the demonstration of um, individual and family resilience and community resilience. Um, I've witnessed just more recently, the, um, the pressures of the pandemic um, cause a lot of our people to gather more wild foods, to practice more gardening and that, you know, brings back this uh, um, ancestral intelligence and it's all reconnection. So I feel like it's a really intimate pathway towards healing in, in many, many ways. So that's, that's what I've witnessed. So true. Um, I'm just being so, it's just such a good hearted effort, you know, that brings it all to life and that these are recipes that we carry in our DNA and in our bodies. And I know Dr. Warren, you talk about, you know, epigenetics and the power of that, that shift in um, the, the change in the environment, but returning back to it. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any um, words to share around how, how traditional foods really do help people recover from trauma, more of a trauma informed approach um, and how they encourage resilience. Yeah, when we look at the idea of epigenetics, that's when we have um, toxic stress that can have an impact on DNA. So we've actually uh, proven that toxic levels of stress and unresolved trauma has an impact on gene expression and can even change the, the DNA molecules. What's really remarkable is that that can be reversed. So the work that Nephi and other, others do in the field of recovery um, it, it can't just be one approach, you know, so the, the counseling is very important, but nutritional support is also very important. And there's a growing field of nutritional epigenetics where we can actually look at food as potential toxins. And uh, if we're having toxic food, that can also potentially change gene expression. So it's kind of an emerging area of science. And what's really fascinating, but also in some ways really disheartening when I, when I go home, uh, to, to my home community, and I see, you know, there's so much poverty and not access to healthy foods. I see so many young people, five, six-year-old kids drinking sodas and eating the spicy Cheetos or whatever the, the, the popular food happens to be, and it makes me wonder, you know, not just from a nutritional perspective in terms of fat content and, and lack of protein and carbohydrates, simple sugars, but what's happening at the cellular level? What's happening at the the genetic level when we have these toxins. It's not just trauma from historical trauma and uh, emotional and spiritual trauma. I think we're having nutritional trauma in a lot of our communities. We haven't identified or and defined that very well. What's really exciting about this field of epigenetics though, is that there are traditional foods, including choke berry, that can actually reverse methylation of DNA. So one of the, the epigenetic changes is what's called methylation. It's adding a methyl group to uh, one of the components of DNA. And actually the, the extract of chokeberry, which we've always called a food as medicine, actually can demethylate uh, the DNA and reverse epigenetics. So I think there's a, an entire uh, growing field of epigenetics, but really an opportunity to link uh, traditional knowledge to modern science. And again, I appreciate uh, the comment that it's not that we need modern science to validate what we know. If anything, modern science needs to learn from us as indigenous people. We had a lot of answer, uh, answers. And also just thinking about STEM and uh, uh, science and engineering, you know, we've always been scientists. We had different terms for it, but this is not a foreign arena to us. 
And I think that the, the idea of nutritional epigenetics and recovering from trauma by using food as medicine is something we've always known. And I think that we're finally uncovering the scientific platforms to better understand it, to teach it to our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters. You're so right. I, I'm so grateful that we've come so far from the thrifty cell gene story <laughs> and that we're now, you know, uh, that, that message to people, to our people was that you were just doomed to get diabetes, you know, <laughs> and, and now, um, you know, being able to, to listen to you share the, that information, it's like, this is not the remedy is our, our foods. Mm -hmm. And we've always, we've always known that to be right and true. It's, it's our identity and it can't just live by words alone. The time has to be put into it for us to return to those things. And that magic ingredient, the one that really matters the most is the love that we have for, for our foods and one another. And, um, and faith, I've heard you talk about that so uh, so well before in a keynote speech years ago, um, but the, the magic ingredient is, is love and our love for one another. And I'm wondering if you have some words to share on how that your shoes, okay. helps people with um, your shoes. encouraging their trauma, encouraging recovering from trauma and encouraging resilience. I'm sorry, who are you referring to? Um, uh, you, you're the winner. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right. So um, I just, all kinds of things are racing through my mind, but I'll try to cover it quickly. I think the key to this resurgence, that resurgence of nutritional, the healing of nutritional trauma is to always remember to make it intergenerational because when you go to a conference, we've, kind of bought into a western concept where we put the youth tract and the elder tract that is really anti-cultural because I was always with my grandma when she was learning things and she was never too old to learn so I think when we do these things we need to not separate the youth from the elder because they have so much to teach us at 72 you know my grandchildren are my big teachers so I think if we continue to incorporate that in this lab, this native lab of indigenous resurgence of food is such a right place to do that. And then as far as um, the DNA work, um, in our language, we okna is what we call DNA, and it means in the blood. So we already have it in the blood. And when that healing occurs, all those old messages come back. And I'll give you an example. It took me 72 years to have the corn talk to me that 600 year old corn that I told you about this summer um, a storm was coming we've had some ferocious storms come through and they always do on the northern plains but with climate change here a little bit more and so this huge storm they had um, huge hail in Rosebud and Nebraska and it was coming and so uh, my son was saying you better he said that I don't know what you can do but there's a big storm coming so I went out and I talked to the corn and I was pulling weeds and I said, you know what, my babies, my corn babies, you're going to have to get ready tonight. And I said this all in our language, the thunders are coming. So you're going to have to really prepare yourself and make yourself strong, however you can do that, because we've got to survive the night. And so I was just babbling away. And all of a sudden, this little corn plant beside me started to vibrate. And it scared the dickens out of me. I stopped and I looked over there and I thought, did I imagine that? Am I losing it? And so I looked away and I said, I want to stare at you, but did you talk to me? And um, are we going to be ready for tonight? And that little plant vibrated again. And I thought, oh my gosh, it took me 72 years to listen to the language of the corn. And so I called my auntie, uh, Mary Louise Defender, who was 88, and I was all excited. And I said, I heard the corn talk. I heard them communicate. And she said, of course, Tojan, why do you think we had corn songs? She said, now you got to make your own corn song. So I thought it was the most natural thing in the world for her so that I'm composing my corn song. So I think when we begin to have that persistence, that um, dedication, because if they are spirits, we can't just like lightly talk about them. We also have to honor them because one of my teachers, when he's one of the last Ihangtuan that is raising our corn, I asked him to come and talk to some of the youth. And he said, you know, and I was late. I was 15 minutes late meeting him. And he was sitting there twiddling his thumbs and I walked in and he looked at me and he said, hmm, I'm just watching your behavior. He said, 
you said 11 o'clock, 11.15. And I said, he said, when you raise the plants and you take care of their spirits, he said, you can't be late. And he said, because that's called abuse. And he said, you have to respect their spirit. So it made me think that you can't just like use it in a curriculum or talk about it to sound cool. It really is a respectful element of that spirit. So that was a real good teacher for me. And then the other indigenous framework, I think that we have to remember to remind ourselves is the language, because all of this conversation that we're having is codified in our language and every separate language in that rich diversity. And I remember Uncle Vine Deloria, I'm from the Deloria family. And um, I remember Uncle uh, Vine and Dan Wildcat talked about in their book, The Power of Place. And they said, there's no difference between cultural diversity and biological diversity. They're one and the same because we patterned themselves after them, just like um, the individuals talked about with the Buffalo Nation, the salmon, you know, whatever relative leads us in the place-based location that we're, we are in. But if you look at those words and you look at the word harvest, harvest means to, um, to get knowledge, to get smart, woksapa. And the other thing it says is wasutu, is to give birth. Every time you see the word tu in there, then it means to give birth. And so there's so many behavioral aspects that are built into the language. And so we don't have to shame the young people. We just say, okay, let's look that up. Even if you look it up in a dictionary, what does it mean to, to plant? What does it mean to do all of this? And one of the things that we learned when we began to look at linguistics in our Dakota language for the word for water, every single element that is tied to water has a ghi sound, like maga is um, geese, magaju is rain, but you hear that ga sound, so it's a key word. So those are kind of delicious learnings that you um, you begin to pick up. And I think the other thing is that the curriculum, the lab, the framework for indigenous knowledge is sitting there pulling weeds talking to the plants because all of a sudden you become aware of the my son is a bow hunter and he told me when he goes out and sits it takes an hour for nature to calm down and accept him he said they will be quiet for about an hour because they're watching what you're going to do and then within that hour he said they'll start talking and the same thing is out in the garden when you're out there especially early in the morning all of a sudden you recognize those bird songs you recognize who's awake who's watching you and they really are watching you and so that's the first step into that natural world of indigenous science is that those ecosystems are so closely linked that all of a sudden the room is big. The room is filled with all of those relatives that are there with you. And so I think that's the, and we don't need to make that into a big curriculum. We make that into a behavior that is linked with the language, the respect of the elders, the intergenerational key, um, how you, for example, when, um, I had some of the youth come out and they were raking, they burned um, the corn, they put them in piles and I had them come out and they were, there was four of them. And they, I said, okay, we're going to rake them up. We're going to burn them. And so they were doing that. And they did what I, my sister came up with a word called scabbity who, which means do it any which way. And so I went out there and I started picking up some of the corn and I said, you know what my grandma said? She told me that when I do a job in, if I haven't completed it, if I see her out picking it up, then that's a signal for me to go help her. And so right away they jumped up and they said, sorry, Kunshi. And they went over there because they kind of did a scabbity who job of picking up the corn stalk. But I did it in a gentle way and we started la laughing and they said, what's that word, scabbity who? So they were fascinated. So you got to be, you know, not shaming, but humorous, however you can do it. But the key is intergenerational because no curriculum is going to do it. Okay, I'll say about that much for now. Thank you so much, Faith. That reminded me of, uh, I heard an elder say once that our curriculum is the landscape. That, that was our first form of literacy, you know, to be able to read the read the, the mountainside or the water so that we knew how to provide for ourselves, but also that it was our, it's not just resources. There's our, our relatives and our greatest teachers waiting for us right outside the door. Yep. Um, and I certainly see that with my children. They probably come by honestly, but they're completely different people when they're outside. <laughs> we spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, 
All right, we're gonna actually move into questions from the, um, the people joining us today, all you out there. And, uh, and so ask questions in the question and answer box. I've got some folks that are helping me to not have a panic attack by reading through all of them and trying to be like excited about this conversation, which I am. Uh, so one really fun uh, question that came so far, uh, it's lost here. Okay, how do um, you all see your work connecting to other indigenous cultures of the world? Uh, for example, a connection to the global South. And I think that if anybody wants to answer that, we'll just open it up. I guess I could just take the first um, uh, uh, opportunity to answer that actually with our PhD in Indigenous Health, it does have a global focus. So uh, we have faculty who are, of course, American Indian, but we also have Alaska Native and First Nations uh, from Canada who are on faculty with us. And we include Indigenous populations worldwide, including uh, Australian Aboriginal populations and Maori populations in New Zealand, other Pacific Islanders. But there's also uh, indigenous populations that are so thriving even in Europe, like the Sami peoples in northern uh, Norway. So we are looking at this from a from a international perspective because we have such a shared history when it comes to colonization and marginalization, and then the subsequent impact on poor health status. But what we're seeing internationally is that the the populations that are recovering are the ones that are re-engaging traditional indigenous systems, even food systems. Did anyone else want to share about that? I've got another question. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think from like a from a cook standpoint, I think that's uh, that's 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 very true. I really like what uh, Dr. Warren said. It's um um, I think the commonality that we have is that we're all uh, resurgent cultures against colonialism, and uh, I think it would be neat to have. Uh, one day someone articulate how colonialism is a disease or a health disparity, you know, like, does it have symptoms, you know, is it symptomatic, is it progressive, is it fatal, uh, what characteristics of colonialism are we embodying that end up, you know, producing those high stress levels and make us um, behave toxically or it produce those ill health effects. So I think, uh, again, kind of going back to that, that statement that the foodways and the return to landscape and culture and language, um, we're so conscious of the issues and we think we're close to the problem as indigenous peoples, but we're also very close to the solution. So that's pretty cool. That's what I think we have in common globally. So that sentiment, you know, think local, act globally, same kind of same thing, or think global, act locally, kind of a, uh, I like that too, so. The global. I'd like to add. Go ahead, Faith. Um, I'd like to add something. I think that, um, you know, how nowadays it's becoming a more accepted practice, finally, of land acknowledgement that when you open a speech or something that you're in, you, you're asked to acknowledge whose land you're on. So I think that's, and, and if they're not doing that to make sure that happens, especially with the younger generation, because that's, they're stepping in the footprints of the people who used to be there. The second thing is to look at colonialism's law, which is the logic of elimination, erase and delete. And that's the basic principles that uh, is mandated by settler colonialism is to erase us. So I think, although, um, you know, in the curriculums at the college and the PhD level, all of that, the researchers, I think, could combine with the oral historians and the memories and the ceremonies to remember where the migrations occurred. Because in the 600 year old corn that I talked to you about, that came from the South. And so the migration stories talk about um, the, the corn making its way north and then back. And so there's a continual wasutu, um, the seeds are making a migration on their own. And so when we can align ourselves with that, it's almost like they have their own winter count. And so by learning that for each of those, then they will also help us because in my years as an elder, now that I'm 72, I always know that through prayer, when you ask for help, doors open. And so we don't need to do it just to have an academic paper we could do it to uh, restore the knowledge of our own history to our communities. And like the lady earlier, I think it was Twyla, was talking about the young man that realized that his 
grandfather was involved in a massacre. So I think that's linking the, it's reaching across the generations. And there's a lot more that's happening without us actively being aware of it. And if I could add a really fast story here, um, I was told about this individual on one of the uh, homelands around here where they were having a ceremony and the spirits told this young man to go bring this white uh, teacher that was at their college to the ceremony. And nobody knew him, but they identified him and they brought him and they didn't know he was not very, um, you know, tuned into our Dakota, Lakota world. So they were very patient with him, but they thought, why do we have to bring him in? And the spirit said, be patient. So they brought him to ceremony and he began to became, become aware of our ways. And it went on for about 15 or 16 years. Everybody got older and then he got sick and he got MS and he started to deteriorate. And he said he needed to go home and see his homeland. He was white, Euro-American, and his homeland was Minnesota. So they took him back there. The spirit said, you know, honor his wish. What they found out is that his grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather was the one, the farmer in the Dakota Wars who sheltered Little Crow. He hid them in their basement. So what the spirits were doing is they were returning the favor and they were thanking. That reached across spirit years. That is totally amazing. So that's why prayers are important because it's not just us about us as human beings in our physical state. There's unseen things that are happening that are pretty exciting. If we just be persistent, try to be as um, humble as we can and offer those thank, you, thank yous and not forget the young and the old and the in-between, we'll get there. That's such a beautiful story. Um, and it's, and it's time, that was actually leading me into the next question that was asked. Um, how can non-Native people show up in this work or support this work in a respectful way? I guess I could try to take the, the first step at that as well. You know, in my, my own experience, just working in medicine and, and with public health programs, we have a lot of non-Indigenous allies and friends and champions. And I think that that's what, you know, a starting point that I've seen a lot of people from multiple backgrounds work effectively with their people. So if, there, if there's ways to contribute in your professional life, that's one, one thing to consider. And the other is just when, when we see discrimination or marginalization, uh, I think we each have a responsibility to say something or do something. And I think that quite often we see examples of discrimination in this country occur and it goes unchecked or unbalanced. And I think that it's a responsibility for all of us when we identify those things, when we observe those things, to say something and do something about that. So it could be anything from just in your own personal life and your own circle of friends and, and colleagues to make sure that we're not discriminating, but then even as a professional, there's so many opportunities to contribute to improving health, education, and all kinds of elements of, uh, of our, our people's lives. I'd like to add something to that. This is Faith. Um, I think that it behooves us to learn ourselves about what settler colonialism is because what it does is it helps us to recognize what are the characteristics of settlers when they come in to colonize. Because once we understand what those characteristics are, they're pretty common. And probably one of the best books that I ever read is um, by Franz Fanon in Wretched of the Earth. And he talks about what happened in Algeria. And you look at some of those characteristics and they're pretty common. So once you can identify those, when you have people coming into our territories because they have this savior syndrome sometimes, not because they're bad, but they also have to be somewhat, I don't want to say police, but they have to keep, you have to keep an eye on them because they will harvest because that's what settlers do. And so you saw it happen at Standing Rock, you know, while all of us were in our humble teepees or our yurts or whatever, when the settlers came in with their characteristics, they started building houses at Standing Rock. I mean, they were just like had whole crews of lumber being hauled in by trucks and they were building houses. So it's kind of like in their DNA. So like the individual before me said is that you have, to, if you see it, it's your responsibility not to um, destroy that person, but to say, maybe, um, you know, you remember however you say it in your 
we all have our ways of doing that. We have a water scientist that came into our territory after um, Standing Rock, and she said, I came to help. And I said, well, that's good, but it could be kind of dangerous because I don't know what you're trying to help with. You need to kind of detox from the Western world before we can figure out what your role would be. And so she's still here four years later, but it's been take, it's taken a lot of detoxing. And she would have been dangerous that first week because she wasn't aware of those settler uh, characteristics. So that's what I would add. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add one one thing also is um, I think ways that people can support um, of the, the multitude of viewers that are watching is if you're in a position to be a decision maker, uh, or we all are decision makers, whether it's family, um, in, our, in our jobs or careers or communities, um, or even making decisions for larger people in like, uh, say, councils or government or, um, agencies, I think uh, really taking a close look at power dynamics in terms and relation to colonialism and how those indigenous values clash with the, cl the, the power dynamics and how we distribute resources to indigenous communities and people um, to not have strings attached to meet really strict criteria that prevent people from like, pre prevent people like myself or Twyla from doing community-based work as it relates to health. And so I feel like um, decision makers and policy makers and even on the legal side, there should be a, uh, um, uh, a way to uh, create the language and the articulation for us to protect ourselves um, legally at the political level and the policy level and all the way down to the individual. So um, a lot of um, a good examination of power dynamics is important, I think, you know, as a way to support. I feel like um... It's also kind of important to know the role of an ally and understanding that I mean for us this is a healing process and it's um what we it's not just for us I mean it is it is we're the priority but what's good for us is good for everybody too when we can address these nutrient guidelines when we can address that there's this toxic environment surrounding us every single day not just us but all people uh I think we can really, you know, renew the, the, like I said, the, the world, our friends, our neighbors, our community, that we're all a part of this. Um, and it's going to take all of us really to make that shift, but to know also the, the reason, you know, in just the last 10 years, I've been doing this work. I'm such a baby that, uh, knowing that, that, if I were to be speaking this way in the 1900s, I'd probably be arrested, you know, <laughs> that, that these, that's the, the trauma that we're coming from as well. And we recognize that we're in an era of opportunity, but that, um, you know, keeping our knowledge to ourselves in our family and our community has been part of a survival mechanism that's kept us, um, it served us. And, and now to, you know, to Faith's point, uh, part of colonialism is the, the erasure and invisibility of a people. And so we have to be more visible in this space. And um, in that process, you know, I think about my friend, Abby Echohawk, who always says, come to us because we have answers, not, you know, out of pity. We have some solutions. <laughs> and so um, I think just the role of allyship and knowing how to show up in the space is, is, poss is part of the part of the work. Um, I have a direct question for Twyla and Nephi about everyone's really curious about how to prepare acorns. Is that we should take a moment to shift back to some amazing foods. Twyla, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, every community, every region has their own type of acorn. And in this Southwest region, we have Emory Oak acorns, one of the various numbers of acorns available. But for Apaches, we harvest Emory Oak acorn, which is the only acorn in the entire world. You do not have to leach, makes it so unique and amazing. And it's something you just collect, wash, well not wash, rinse off all the debris, then dry, and after you uh, unshell them, then you just grind them up into a meal. It's a process. It does. It is a, it's not a simple process, but 
the outcome is amazing. The, the taste is great. It's a very acquired taste. And it's, you know, Nephi can explain the rest. He does all those amazing things with food. I can harvest them. I can take them over to Nephi's house and he can probably do something so amazing. So I'll let him share the rest of that. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, acorn is one of my favorite ingredients. Uh, I, I say it just like us when you taste uh, just like us Apaches. It's bitter at the beginning and sweet at the end. <laughs> so it's a, it's, it's a very complex and nutritious flavor. I mean, if you think about it, use, uh, this is why I like acorn so much. And that mixture of seeds is like when, I, uh, when even my palate, right, as a trained chef was colonized, I had this preference for certain ingredients and certain techniques. And then when I came upon um, the seed mix, I had eaten acorn all my life and really loved it since I was a little kid. Um, but when I had the combination of seeds, tasting it, it was uh, really kind of grassy, really bit, uh, notes of bitterness, notes of um, um, like uh, sunflower seeds, pinions of bitterness, they're all combined. What, what I encourage you to do is use your sense of taste as an investigative tool and say, why did my ancestors appreciate this flavor? Why has it stood the test of time for this long when we've detached from others, you know? And so um, for me, uh, acorn, acorn stew, it's um, uh, once, once upon a time when I was a young, uh, young cook, I tried, to, uh, I tried to recreate acorn stew. I, uh, basically, I tried to use a Western uh, in, uh, seasoning ingredient called mirepoix, which is corn, be uh, I'm not corn beans and squash, uh, carrot, celery, and onions. Usually you do that to make a broth in, in a Western classical set. And it's the aromatics for the Gibbs Foundation. Well, I tried to do that with acorn stew and my parents were all looking at me like, they're all like, what the heck are you doing, you know? And then when it, when it was done, it, it. it came up, it did nothing, I ruined it. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and so I've never tried to do that again. It's, it's like it has its own identity and you just let it be what it is, you know? It's like teaching that respect, you know? It's like, oh, okay, you know? And that was the lesson that the acorn cool. taught me. But the preparation um, most common is that long process of collection, the, the cleaning, the grinding, and it's usually um, um, stirred into soups uh, in the wintertime. Um, it's really good on roasted vegetables, like summertime, late summer, roast some zucchini where it's kind of charred and sprinkle some on top of that and uh, some chili flakes and your stuff. Oh so it's pretty cool. That's so good. I'm so grateful <laughs> that we don't get to see everybody's hungry faces. Can you imagine like, 500 hungry faces looking at you right now while you describe the decadence of acorns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, we have a question on commodity foods and I'd love to hear what Dr. Warren would have to say to this. It says, any thoughts on how to improve the quality of foods provided through the FDIPR program or the food distribution program on Indian reservations, AKA old school commodities. Lard was included until about 10 years ago. Cow's milk is not native and problematic for many. Do you agree that this is a problem? And if so, what would be the best route to get it removed from commodity programs? Yeah, it's a, a huge problem. And, and historically, I think the commodity foods are at the root of many of our disparities in diabetes and heart disease and cancer because there's a lot of toxic food historically. Yeah, they used to distribute uh, large containers of pure corn syrup. And if you know how corn syrup is produced, you know, corn is sacred, but the, the way it's chemically altered um, to make corn syrup is actually very unhealthy. And on the label of the, the commodity corn syrup, it said, use in your baby formula. So they were encouraging, essentially poisoning our babies at that time. It's really a horrible history. It has improved a lot over the last uh, decade or two. And, and they're are improvements to commodity food programs, but I would love it for us to get to the point where we really have food sovereignty and are not dependent on USDA programs. And, you know, when we think of traditional food now, a lot of people think of fry bread, but fry bread is not traditional American Indian food. The roots of fry bread are actually from the commodity food program, people doing the best they can with their commodities. So when we, when we say fry bread is traditional, I like to remind people, you can call it traditional, but it's traditional USDA food, not traditional American Indian food. So true. And we know that through that, you know, the boarding school era that those taste buds, uh, those children, you know, several generations were fed those ingredients and that those taste buds, the preferences altered. 
but you know, as you pointed out before, the field of epigenetics and what we already know um, to be right and true is that when you return to your traditional foods, your taste buds will also start to prefer those things. Uh, up here, I hear elders say it all the time. I've got to feed my Indian, you know, as they're standing over fire roasted salmon or a bowl of huckleberries. And, uh, and I feel that I know what that means just to wake up craving the seasonality and getting into a tune with the you know, the seasons and the environment around us by just anchoring in that traditional food. Um, I think we have one time for one more question. We have seven hot minutes. Uh, so how do, and this is open to everyone, how do we encourage our people to eat healthfully when it's very difficult to do so, um, even in our pandemic, you know, for many of our people? And I, I don't know if anybody, any of you have experienced having to quarantine. Um, I did a couple weeks ago and was pretty shocked when I, you know, called up our public health department to figure out testing. And uh, basically I was told to like stay put for five full days and then come in to get, you know, a Q-tip poked up my nose. And, um, and no, no advice on, you know, like how to eat to build your immunity and maybe diminish your chances of going to the hospital or <laughs> disinfecting your home or opening up the windows and airing things out. I mean, I knew, all, I knew of those things because I had been geeking out and researching and also just of the teachings of uh, traditional medicines and how to hold them in your house. But, um, Shouldn't we be encouraging people to do more, you know, immunity building and intentionally eating these foods now more than ever uh, in, you know, today's global pandemic world we live in? Yeah. Um, uh, oh, good, Twyla. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. Who? Twyla. I think you were. Okay. Okay. I like to add on, on that. I like to say this is a real awakening is what's happening to us this is an awakening to not only indigenous people but to people globally to look at the food that we're investing into our body and how is that food going to help us in in through crisis like this and is that food going to protect us or is it going to help break us down you look at processed food versus healthy food. Even though healthy food is hard to come by, and that's the truth in my community, you look at healthy traditional food, you have to commute long distance. And having to have, during this pandemic, was having to have regulations of being unable to go harvest and forage for a period of time was very difficult, but still having access to those food. I think, not I think, but I know for people to understand the importance of Mother Earth, what she has to offer, which are these. These are things I give to, to um, patients that are dealing with COVID. Um, this is its own nature medicine that will help in that healing process and preventive me me measures. But I think it's helping people to reconnect with the traditional medicines and not only their medicines but also to look at their internal health and what they're consuming you know you look at hot cheetos and you look at corn you know you look at the difference and but there's a big difference between the two and that's all i, I want to add faith did you want to say anything yeah i, th I think this is an example of one where uh we have to not assume that we have all of those skill sets in place when something comes like this. Back in the day when we had pandemics, we were close to the outdoors, so we knew how to adapt. But now a lot of people have been confined by the houses, the government houses and the, the geofences, everything that is around us. So I think that it's not a given that we know how to do this. So I think on the front end of these things, part of that healing part is offering things like even back in the day when I was young, um, they had that uh, framework of Weight Watchers. And the cool thing about Weight Watchers is it's a support group. It makes excitement about um, recipes. Uh, and 
exercise. And so I think a lot of our diabetic health programs are incorporating that. But there's also an indigenous side to that where you can uh, have the individuals play a role. So I think just the assumption that we know those things, even with, because I've watched our COVID team locally fumble along, but it's by people who didn't grow up in the culture and it's not their fault. They were deprived of it. So we have to assume that we've got to reteach some of those skill sets. That's all I have. Thank you. Lovely. Dr. Warren? Just quickly, in terms of um, how to encourage our people to re-embrace tra traditional foods, I like what Faith said about intergenerational strategies and that uh, really has to start with the children. And unfortunately, some of the foods that we're talking about are difficult to access or in some cases expensive. Even if you look at buffalo meat, if you don't have access to uh, your own herd. Um, so, so we have a lot of work to do and recognize that linking public health principles includes things like economic development, workforce development, educational programs, and having the resources to afford healthy food. But it needs to start with children. Um, my wife is uh, Pawnee in Pueblo and she has a nice garden. And she taught our kids from a very young age to, uh, to grow their own plants. And you know, when my daughter was only about five years old, uh, one time we're having dinner and she says, mom can I have more kale. I mean, how often do you hear a five-year-old say that? But, but because you said, Anna, this is your kale, you grew this. And when she felt that connectivity to growing it herself, then she embraced it. And it's just a, a wonderful thing. And that's part of what we would do historically too, is, is have that as a, a intergenerational and familial process of growing healthy foods. And we have to engage the next generations if we're going to have long-term impact. I love it. And, and I'd, I'd like to add to all, all a layer on to all of that really great stuff that was just said. I, I think from a, like an everyday standpoint or those of us that are busy uh, social distancing or quarantining, um, what we need, uh, one, one entryway that I always share is anytime you go to on your essential run to do some grocery shopping, just keep in mind that uh, 60 to 70 percent of all the foods in the grocery store are indigenous foods. They've got roots throughout Turtle Island. And even just understanding that, uh, take it upon yourself while we're while we've got a lot of time. Use your device to um, to look up, uh, do your own investigation into uh, history of indigenous foods of the Americas. You can even Google it, pick up a couple of good books. But even that element of the historical um, information about the origins of tomatoes, chilies, corn, beans, squash, all those nutritious berries, even our fermented traditional drinks that are good for the gut biome and the gut bacteria. Um, all of those are in, have really powerful indigenous roots. And that also is not just the physical nutrition, that's the psychological and spiritual nutrition that comes by learning and reclaiming all that knowledge that's all around us. So um, if you can't can completely grow a garden or go foraging and do all those things, it, um, I always say as a chef, uh, the United States has been practicing Native American cuisine for 500 years and, and they didn't know it. So um, just acknowledge that and do some research into the, uh, your favorite foods. All chilies, all corn, all bean, all squash, uh, they're all indigenous foods and there's a longer list. And that really opens up your paradigm to food and indigenous power and strength and science. And it's cool, so check it out. So many uh, yeah, chilies and avocados and you know, so, many, so many things that are from here that are also like great antioxidants in the body that we also need glutathione you know things that are going to help you just totally detoxify i'm so grateful and i really don't want this to end we're one minute over which i feel like is a success because if it were up to me we'd be here for hours and i know that we're all really busy people but it's like a just this conversation should be never ending <laughs> we should just be living it all the time um, but I'm so grateful for all of you and all of your time and wisdom that you shared today and all those stories coming through you um, just to be big medicine for the people. And just a reminder that, yeah, you don't have to be all of the things, you know, this is a community of work here. Um, it's going to take all of us. And so if you can just choose one thing and be that champion, it would imagine what we could all do. Uh, and so thank you for your time. Thank you for the turnout. Uh, Mindy's got some things to share with you about next uh, chapters of, of her work and the work that, important work that she does convening people. And, um, and again, I'm just really grateful to spend this time with all of you today. Thank you. Well, thank I'd you. like to thank all the panelists, uh, of course, Val Segrest and Nephi Craig, 
Twyla Cassador, Don Warren, and Faith Spotted Eagle for a wonderful, wonderful panel discussion. Uh, and I would like to let you all know that first of all, we are recording this and we'll post it and we'll email you a link to the video so that you can watch it afterwards if you'd like to. And a couple of other things. Uh, we're going to post in the chat a link to a poll, which we'd love if you'd fill out to give us feedback about today's panel discussion. And also if you have ideas for other webinars, we listen to you and we would love to hear what you'd like to see. And, uh, and, and finally, um, we are going to have another series of webinars, which will be celebrating indigenous women chefs. We have seven indigenous women chefs who are, I see Nephi supports this, great, who are uh, going to be doing monthly webinars beginning, I believe, January 12th. And we've posted in the chat a link where you can register for the first one and you'll see uh, what who the other chefs are that we're gonna have each month from January through July. And then in August, we're gonna have a panel discussion with all of the indigenous women chefs in celebration of their work. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you to the panelists. This was a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>